Well, been to an ER lately? Did you have to wait long, or was it even closed? We've convened our national checkup panel looking for some answers. Danielle Martin is a family physician at Women's College Hospital. Jay Udell, cardiologist, Peter Monk Center, cardiac center. Howard Ovens is an emergency physician at Mount Sinai Hospital, also here in Toronto. And Don Mullady, geriatric emergency physician, Mount Sinai. Their thoughts in a moment, but first, some background. Canadians love the ER. In fact, we make 16 million visits a year. But we wait when we do, on average, about four hours to see a doctor. 10% wait eight hours or longer. It's even worse for seniors. Among those 65 and older who require admission, one in 10 wait more than 28 hours to get a bed. Why all the waiting? The lack of fast access to family doctors is a factor. But a chronic shortage of ER doctors is the main reason. In some parts of the country, hospitals are so understaffed, they have to close their emergency rooms at certain hours. All these bad stats lead to one last one. Canada is ranked last out of 11 leading developed nations for emergency department care. So how do we fix our ER problems? Time for some answers. All right, Jay, you start us off. We, I mean, we, there are a couple of hints in, in, in that little pack, but why are we as Canadians such high users of ERs? Well, Canadians are getting older. There's more immigration to the big cities, urbanization, as well as um, resource requirements as those people are getting older, they're requiring more healthcare needs. So access to primary care is certainly an issue, but there's also the question of how we get patients to where they need to be after the hospital. That's also an issue that we should talk about. And all of that creates a bottleneck at the hospital and the front doors, the, the marketplace is the emergency room. And so what the public perception is, is that the emergency room wait times is a reflection of all of those stresses on the system. Is abuse of, of the system a problem as well? Uh, do we abuse the fact that we have ERs, emergency departments? Well, I'm not sure that abuse is the right word necessarily, but we know that although, for example, the vast majority of Canadians have a family doctor or a primary care provider, probably about half of us can't access that person on the same day when we call because we're sick and we need to be seen today. Similarly, as a family doctor, if I see a patient in my office who has a, a condition that is more acute than I can deal with in a 15-minute visit in my office, pretty much the only option that I have had, at least in the past, has been to send my patient to the emergency room. So we haven't created enough other entry points to the healthcare system. Um, and so with the, with the result that actually, as Jay says, it's not just the front door to the hospital, it's pretty much the only door to the hospital. And therefore, uh, both family doctors and primary care providers and patients tend to use it. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about wait times. And Howard, I want you to help us on this because you, you, you face this, you study this. But I, I, I should declare, first of all, that I, I was in uh, the emergency department at the hospital where I live in Stratford, Ontario on Sunday night. Uh, there was a family emergency. We got to the hospital and it took less than a minute before we were looked after. So I, I can hardly personally complain, but you can't argue with the numbers and obviously there are issues out there. Talk to me about um, uh, wait times and, and what's behind the long wait times. Well, uh, briefly, uh, we also have to distinguish waiting from care and the average uh, number that was quoted of four hours is not how long you wait to see a doctor, it's how long the average person spends in the emergency department. The average wait time to see a doctor from arrivals more like an hour to an hour and a half across the country. Is um, that acceptable? Well, um, if you have a, a good system of triage, if, as in your wife's case, if you're met free, uh, rapidly by a nurse, if that nurse is enabled to uh, initiate tests and treatments uh, using uh, a tool we call medical directives, then in the average case, uh, that's probably pretty reasonable. Um, but then uh, we run into a lot of problems with uh, access to uh, inpatient beds. And we do have in Canada one of the lowest numbers of acute care beds per capita of all the uh, OECD 32 countries. And as a result, patients wait too long to get a bed and those patients tend to clog up the emergency department and get in the way of newly arriving patients, and that's a big problem. Don, you uh, are, are particularly focused on uh, on the elderly in terms of their 
uh, how they're received in emergency uh, departments. Are they the, the are they the most vulnerable in this problem that we face? Well, I think older people in our society in general are among the most vulnerable. So when they come to the emergency department, they're vulnerable and also are among the most complex patients that we see. So certainly, um, as the lead-in suggested, they do tend to wait longer. But as Howard says, that's often because they're having a lot of different uh, issues addressed. And that's one of the most important things about older people in emergency situations is that, that they never have just one problem. They have multiple chronic problems which all are active when any one of their problems are active. So the ability to address all of those issues, if we're going to do it well, is necessarily going to take uh, longer. So when a, an older person stays in an emergency department for six, eight, 10 hours, I'm not sure, I, I personally think that's not necessarily a failure as long as there's a su successful outcome from it. Ideally, avoiding an admission to the hospital would be the best outcome. So if we can do really good things fast in one setting, that's probably a big win for the older person. Return him or her back to uh, their place of residence with their issues addressed, all of their issues addressed, not just the one broken wrist, but all of their issues ad addressed so that they can function back where they came from. Danielle, you're the, the family doctor sitting at the table. Uh, a couple of times already we've mentioned this issue of the family doctor problem as it relates to the, uh, the uh, emergency department issues. Talk to us about that. So, I mean, the first thing I think we need to say is that uh, we probably don't really have a family doctor shortage anymore in Canada. We did at one time. Um, it, almost every Canadian now has a family doctor. What we do have a problem with in primary care is getting same day access to one's family doctor or primary care provider when we need it. And that can contribute to problems in the emergency department. But the other thing that often happens, as I mentioned earlier, is when you see a patient in primary care who's more complex or needs an urgent referral to a specialist or needs urgent imaging, or needs a CT scan, you know, today or tomorrow, um, it, it's actually virtually impossible in most communities in Canada to get another, to get access to those things through any means other than sending the person to the emergency department. And so ironically, we actually see a lot of people ending up in the emergency department at the recommendation of their primary care provider. And so where a lot of the action is right now that's exciting and really positive in the healthcare system and the changes that we're seeing made is trying to find better ways to help family doctors help their patients in an urgent manner that doesn't require sending that person to the emergency department. Well, what about once you get to the emergency department? Are, do doctors want to work in the ED? Is that where they want to be? Absolutely. We uh, have a very popular training program. We in, Certainly in Toronto, we get at least uh, 15 times the number of applicants for the number of spots. We do, like family medicine, have some distribution issues uh, where in some communities, especially smaller volume emergency departments, uh, attracting and keeping emergency physicians or family physicians who ideally combine emergency practice with the other needs of their community. When you say smaller volume, I mean there's just not enough patients? You're just not getting enough traffic in those departments? Uh, so, well, it's, yes. And that's, uh, you know, a smaller emergency department um, is not as attractive for certain types of emergency physicians. If you're a career emergency physician, if you want to be uh, working with colleagues who have other like interests and uh, that's your career focus, then uh, working in a smaller department doesn't always meet those career aspirations. So we really need family doctors who continue to practice emergency medicine and meet the f whole spectrum of healthcare needs of their communities. Jay, do you want to talk about the, the, the question of whether you want to be working in an ED? Okay, so that's an absolute yes. I mean, that's where the best care that can be provided in terms of acuity, if someone's acutely ill, you can really make a difference. In my line of work, we can save lives with heart attacks. So I just want to just to frame the, the perspective, just taking a piece of everyone. So from Danielle's right. point of view, 
you know, what we don't have in our system right now is any flexibility because of either demands financially or demands on our time to accommodate when there's an emergency at the drop of a hat, if there's either a change in someone's um, social security network so that they can't cope with their illness that's changed, or if there's an acuity issue to get a rapid evaluation, there is really nothing in our system. So from my practical point of view, I actually build it in so that I have an hour free, we call it lunch, that I actually then use to, to accommodate family physician requests to see patients urgently so that we can prevent people from coming into the emergency room. On the other side of things, you're hearing that it's not, I don't think personally, a lack at least in major uh, centers in terms of the excitement or the interest in practicing, but there is so much pressure in the emergency room, once you've decided that that patient needs in a, to be hospitalized, it's not that they're necessarily not being seen urgently, it's that they can't be then admitted quickly because we have quite a lot of demands in terms of getting patients out of the hospital. So it's not that those patients are, because of their illness, uh, they can't be moved from an emergency room setting into the admission, into the uh, you know surgery or et cetera. It's because that bed that they need to be moved to is being occupied. And in the majority of hospitals, the secret is, is that sadly, the majority of those patients are being occupied by patients that are not acutely ill anymore, but are waiting to be transferred either to a long-term care facility or back to their home with supports. That's a huge you know, limitation of our system at the moment. You're nodding in agreement on that, Doc. Yeah, certainly. So uh, the, within my particular area of interest, geriatric emerge medicine, um, there's this idea of not necessarily thinking of the emergency department as the front door to the hospital, which is what we're talking about here, but rather as a front porch, um, a place where people can come, particularly older people, and have their acute issues addressed so as to avoid admission to the hospital. That's harder to do in many ways, and it requires more people being involved. Um, eMERGE care has always been team-based, but certainly geriatric care, looking after complex older patients, is, is definitely a team sport. And one of the things that eMERGE departments probably haven't been very good at is, is mobilizing a team, an interdisciplinary team of people to look after any of the patients, particularly the older people. So if you've got somebody, an older person, who's had a fall and a broken wrist, um, because of medication problems and maybe because their house isn't properly set up and because their social support network has deteriorated because their daughter has gone away for the week. Um, so it, it's impossible to think that one doctor is going to solve or even mm -hmm. be able to address all those issues. So one thing that is going to be very valuable is if on the front porch of the healthcare system, we've got a doc, a nurse, but also a social worker, a physiotherapist, a pharmacist, who can help and, and access to better care, access to care in the community. Um, that, so that the, if your only option for dealing with any problem is admission to the hospital, then for sure our hospitals are going to get very clogged with older people. But if we can get them moving, that won't be the case. All right, you're helping point us into the future as to what, what needs to be done to change things. And that's where we're gonna to get to in a minute. We've gotta take a quick break, but when we return, the question that affects us all, where is ER care heading in the future? And welcome back to our national checkup on emergency care. At the table tonight, doctors Danielle Martin, Howard Ovens, Don Milady, and Jay Udell. All right, number one tip that you would have for any of us who are heading to the ER? Well, this, the single most important piece of advice I would give people is at the point of discharge, be very clear on the information you're given. Make sure you understand it. Make sure key things are in writing. Review them and ask any questions before you leave. Don't lose the piece of paper. Keep it safe. And ask a few questions about what to expect and what to do if things don't go as expected. You know, and it, that sounds simple, but for so many people, it's simply being able to leave and they right. forget those simple rules. So that's a good one. Uh, how about you, Jay? So going in, if you can remember to bring your medications or a list of your medications, that's really helpful for us when we're treating you. And also at the end, make sure you call your family doctor or the primary care physician that's treating you and let them know that you're in the emergency room. Wouldn't you like, that's a big deal in terms of then that person can call the emergency doc and find out if there was a gap in terms of communication, what exactly happened. 
Don, future, you uh, gave us some hints there before, but give me one other thing. So I think the future um, for emergency departments to start planning now is to be aware that the, the Canadian society of 15 years from now doesn't look like it does now, and neither is the emergency department of the future. It's going to be, there's going to be a lot of old people in emergency departments. Currently, only one out of 12 is over the age of 75 more likely one out of three 15 years from now. So emergency departments have to start planning now, changing their staffing, changing their education, changing their plans, procedures, changing their approach to transitions back to the community. This is the time to start planning for the future. Danielle, you get the last word. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the emergency department is sort of the canary in the coal mine of the healthcare system in many ways. So, you know, the future is, I actually, I think it's quite bright in the in the sense that we now understand that the when we see wait times, for example, in the emergency department, the cure is not to pile more resources on the emergency department. The cure is better integration with primary care, better rapid access to specialty care from primary care, better coordination for people who are leaving the hospital, better access to long-term and other uh, options uh, for residential care for people leaving the hospital so they're not sitting in hospital beds waiting for discharge. If you take that whole system approach, then you solve the problems in the emergency department. But by focusing solely on the emergency department, uh, we, we risk losing our way. All right. Thank you all. Good discussion.